This is your dose of daily market wisdom with master trader Nick Santiago. Starting from humble beginnings, Nick has been beating the markets for over two decades. He shares with you his take on the profitable trades that will have you moving towards financial freedom in no time at all. To see an in-depth review of his track record and much more, go to InTheMoneyStocks.com. Welcome. This is your daily dose of daily market wisdom with master trader Nick Santiago. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is 91721, show number 321. Well, Nick, uh, hey, quad witching hour. Everything's getting hit. Gold and silver have been slammed and slammed again. And what's your take on it? What is being set up here? We've got a Fed meeting next week. There's something going on here. Yeah, there's there's a lot happening out here right now. I can't put my finger on, exactly on it, but I, you know, we went into an overbought condition in the markets. Um, is it just profit taking? Is it quadruple witching options expiration, which is today, and just a lot of money coming off the board? But you know, we've seen weakness in the industrials. We've seen um, obviously a weakness in the indexes really since the start of September. It's not a hard sell, but these markets have continued to decline, and another poor performance out here today. But one thing I want to point out is that really we've been seeing a lot of weakness occur during the week of options expiration. And um, that's been going on pretty much all year. So is it just another move lower and then we rally back up? Historically speaking, September, October are weak periods for the overall market indexes. But there's a lot of question marks out here. I don't have all the answers for this one. But um, right now, I, I will say this much. The S&P 500 is testing its 50-day moving average. And, you know, it's a pretty important uh, area. And we'll, we'll see where we close. But I have to think with a Fed meeting looming on uh, Wednesday, we're probably going to see these markets weak until then. Really? So you don't think we'll have our traditional Monday rally uh, compliments of the PPT? Uh, you could. I couldn't rule that out. Um, but I have to think ahead of this Fed announcement, because this is really a big Fed announcement. You know, everybody's wondering, are they going to comment on a potential tapering? They're also wondering um, what's going on with uh, Jay Powell. He recently ordered an ethics review after several Fed presidents disclosed multi-million dollar uh, positions in stocks. And they said they'd be out by September. You know, it wouldn't look so good if the markets sell out, uh, sell off, and uh, these Fed presidents are jumping out right at the highs. <laughs> yeah, like what is with that? Uh, they don't have conflict of interest rules uh, at the Federal Reserve. Is that what that's about? I thought they did. I, I would have certainly thought that they did. I was not aware um, what that they can actually own stock while they are um, sitting on the Federal Open Market Committee. But apparently, I guess they can. So, you know, um, I guess the politicians can. Hey, listen, there's, there's a different set of rules for everybody out there, Kerry. Uh, rules uh, for you know me that, and rules for me. Or You know how that goes. <laughs> as our good friend uh, Marty Armstrong says, uh, it's the Department of Just Us. Right? Just us. I love just that. Us. <laughs> just us. Not you, just us. And uh, yeah, well, we don't want to get political here because this is a family show and we try to keep away from pornography and obscenity at all costs here. But really, it just get how can these guys be trading stocks? They all should be required as as a result of their position, because let's face it, purportedly, the Fed has the best info out there. They know the crashes are coming before you and I know it, maybe maybe not you, but me for sure, and they've got the info. They know everything. So if that isn't trading on insider info, I don't know what is. And these guys need to be fired and locked up because there's no greater insider information than having the direct pipeline into the Fed. Well, you know, these guys are really the controllers of the liquidity flow. So, you know, everybody thinks presidents have uh, all the power or that they, they, they have nothing when it comes to the economy. It's all about central bank intervention. If people remember back in the early 80s, 82, when Ronald Reagan uh, was, was president, the market skyrocketed higher once Paul Volcker cut interest rates. And again, that was the catalyst. It's about liquidity, liquidity in the system. And when everybody asks, why is the market going up so much it's because we have unprecedented liquidity in the system and it's just not here it's everywhere it's the ecb the european central bank it's the federal reserve it's bank of japan it's bank uh, the australian central bank is central banks everywhere 
flooding the system with printed money and it's got to go somewhere and where does it go it goes into it goes into equities and we'd be remiss if we didn't to discuss the situation in china with Evergrande. right now there's hundreds of people holding the management of that company hostage because they've they're about to default on all their bonds they Every time you read their total indebtedness, it goes up. Last week, it said $300 billion. This week, it's $400 billion. But this company is a huge real estate player. And look, the Chinese government is going to bail them out. If they don't, I will be in complete shock. They might arrest all the management and send them off to re-education camps. But irrespective of that, they're going to bail this out because otherwise the entire property market in China goes bust, and they'll be cascading defaults. They're not the only ones. You know, they're trying to give away discounted uh, condos now in satisfaction of their uh, debt to their investors. And uh, it's you know, this is just uh, ripe for a bailout. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what China does, right? So China just did it with the um, education companies. They're basically essentially taking over these companies. They were private companies, supposedly, and now they're being taken over. Um, <clears throat> I have to think this Evergrande is just going to be a takeover too, government takeover. I believe, you know, China's been injecting massive liquidity into the system because of this Evergrande panic. So um, I have to think it'll be a takeover. That's what they do best over there. They just swallow up somebody's business. I mean, I've never seen um, all of this going on quite this way, but, you know, that, that's how that government works there. And, and you know what, Kerry, to a fair degree, we work the same way here. You know, just go back and look at the financial crisis. I mean, you know, who got bailed out, who didn't get bailed out, you know, it was pick and choose. Um, but this time around, you know, when, when something goes wrong in China, they just, they just absorb it. The government takes it over. And I got to think that's what's going to happen here. Yeah. And look, there's a lot of movement that's been happening in China that you never see in the media here. Uh, you've got uh, basically the uh, the Chinese government taking over all the tech companies. It's been a bloodless, well, maybe not so bloodless, but at least not that we know of, a bloodless coup of all of these oligarchs. And this is gonna is gonna have an effect on China. Hey, I, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, and maybe we'll do a different show on this, but the vernal equinox coming up. We've got record flooding in China at the Three Gorges Dam, record record flow there. We've got mudslides happening, landslides all over the place. Um, you know, this could be the inflection point. They managed to dodge a bullet last year, but this year they said the flooding is worse than it was last year. And they've blown dams, dams have collapsed. They've got thousands of these dams all over the place. But the big one is the Three Gorges and we know the problems with it. Yeah, there are serious problems with it. We've talked about that in the past because that's how long the problems have been around. Uh, this time around, coming up next week, you got a full moon on Monday. You have a fall equinox on Tuesday. Those are big events that can cause, you know, water shifts and uh, tides to rise and, and all sorts of, uh, of different events. So, you know, with the flooding that's going on there and the mudslides that they're seeing and all of the problems they have in the landscape there, yeah, that could be very, very problematic. If that if that dam goes, I mean, that will be a major disruption to the supply chain around the entire world. And I think uh, if the dam goes, or I should say maybe when it goes, because I think we're getting to that point, uh, I think it will be the end of the CCP because that was one of their crowning uh, achievements, infrastructure projects, largest dam in the world, largest hydroelectric power plant in the world, largest reservoir in the world. And all built on a couple of earthquake uh, faults, along with uh, with building techniques, concrete of uh, dubious quality, from when it was planned uh, twenty odd years ago. Well, you know, when you when you look at that project, and and there's been lots of reports about it. I mean, it it just doesn't look very stable. I've just watched the recent videos. Um, of the dam. And I mean, I'm not a trained architect or an engineer, but I just look at it and I say, wow, that, that doesn't look that, that sturdy. It doesn't look really that healthy. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that comes, if it can come through, but you know, with the full moon that's approaching and, and also the fall equinox, which is with the fall, e yeah, with the full moon approaching on Monday, and then you have the fall equinox on Wednesday, you know, the water table can really rise and that, that could be very, very problematic. Well, if it's not now, it's going to happen in the next five years. And, and they just seem to be ignoring it, uh, doing a lot of rug sweeping, which is like what that culture does. 
that's what we do now too. There was a time when the U.S. didn't sweep problems under the rug. We actually addressed them, but uh, that time seems to be over with for now. Well, we're, I guess we're just going to have to see what happens. So cryptos, Bitcoin's in that back in that channel again, Nick. Yeah, I got to say, it's, uh, it's like a weeble wobble right now. Bitcoin just doesn't seem to give it up. Um, you had what we call the potentially a failed pattern, but it never it never broke the support. So it's still hanging in there pretty well, trading at around 47,500 as we speak today. But overall, um, I think you got to still be a bit careful. I'm going to uh, alert my membership tonight on Bitcoin. I've been, I've been getting flooded with comments and, and questions each and every night. So we'll look at it. We'll see how it plays out going into the weekend. But um, yeah, it's amazing. We're just still sitting right in that same range after testing that 44,000 level, but we never closed below there. And uh, it held the support so lives to fight another day hey just remember whenever they really want to drive the price of bitcoin down what they do is they hack an exchange and a whole bunch of money disappears and then all of a sudden it's like well maybe these cryptos aren't so great i mean obviously you can insure against that with your own wallet but people are getting hacked on uh, cryptos every day all the time but mark my words the next time they want to drive it lower, you'll probably see an exchange, a major exchange. Maybe they'll uh, nail Coinbase. It can be done. If there's quantum computers out there, then no cryptocurrency is safe. Wow. I mean, that that's that's the scary part about it. You know, everybody is putting uh, their eggs in that basket thinking that that's the ultimate security. I, I don't feel it is. I'm not saying it can't be traded. It can't be played. I just don't feel it is the ultimate security that it is being touted as. So uh, it's a great point you make. And I, I think you're right. Yeah, well, I guess we're going to find out one way or the other here, like like with every other market here. But uh, just my take on it that uh, it, it really could be the kryptonite for cryptos. No pun intended. Is that a pun? I don't know. But <laughs> crypto, that's kryptonite with a K, like what uh, can kill Superman, just in case you didn't know. Hey, gold and silver, it looks like they're getting their kryptonite now. They got so slammed, quadruple witching. You know, I mentioned to you, like on Wednesday, $2 trillion worth of options expiring. And uh, that gives you a lot of impetus to drive that uh, gold silver price down. Yeah, you are 100% right. And on Thursday, yes, which was yesterday, gold just got absolutely trampled. So did silver and uh, gold miners, everything in the precious metal space just absolutely hammered. And, um, you know, the charts were, were, weren't the prettiest. So, but the silver chart was holding up very, very well. But that got hit really, really hard. It's getting hit pretty hard today again. Um, so we'll see how they play out. But one thing I want to point out, Kerry, is that there is a huge Fed meeting on Wednesday. And if the Fed stays the course and says, hey, we, we see no real need to taper, you know, that's a good, that's a good uh, backdrop for gold to go higher. Which could well explain why it's being driven lower now in the quadruple witching hour. Like you always say, this is the real shark week. The one on TV, that's the fake one. Uh, the sharks are really out, the fangs are out, and they're just devouring unsuspecting investors uh, by the dozen. And that's uh, that's what you expect in a quad witch, right? Absolutely. This is the week. I always tell everybody, be careful this week. The unexpected can always take place, and it usually does. And um, we're seeing, you know, a great drop this week in equities. We're seeing a great drop in the precious metals, and we're seeing a great drop in the industrials this week. I mean, this is this is a pretty good sell-off this week overall, and we haven't really become accustomed to seeing it too often. So it's really a broad-based sell-off then, huh? Oh, I, it's a very broad-based sell-off. There are some sectors that are hanging in there. Um, energy's been choppy, but today it's down. Uh, you see retail hanging in there a little bit, but transports have been hit. Technology has come down. Uh, you see a lot of the bank stocks coming under pressure. So it, it certainly has been um, a very, very turbulent uh, trading week. And as expected, quadruple witch always is. All right, so we need to talk about one other uh, commodity here, uh, and that is uh, Henry Hub Nat Gas. All right, over five bucks. Uh, Nat Gas is up, I think, 130 or 140 percent in the past uh, 12 months. So it's it's leading the commodities. It's up higher than oil, higher than gasoline. You know, Nat Gas, dry Nat Gas. We have to be particular about that. Has been the redheaded stepchild of the energy patch. For going on a decade, 
And you know this because you pay for energy based on BTUs, whether you know it or not, how much energy it puts out that's measured by a British thermal unit, a BTU. And the discount of nat gas to oil has been like 75%, meaning that BTUs that you get from nat gas have been 75% cheaper than BTUs that you get from oil. And there was a shift like 20, 30 years ago where every major building near a gas pipeline and that was burning oil to heat, uh, heat, heat and hot water switched over to nat gas or at least had the ability to switch back and forth because it used to be that, uh, that nat gas, there was no discount. But with fracking and everything else, this discount emerged, this arbitrage. The arbitrage now is getting closed. It needs to uh, go up. Um, I think it's got a triple now hit like 12 to 15 bucks, depending what oil does. If oil goes down, then it only needs to go up less. But this trade's coming. So your feeling is that uh, nat gas has, uh, has had pa a parabolic move and it, it's it, ready it's for making, a pullback? It's making a parabolic move. I don't even think it's over yet. I think there's still, because you just got really, nat gas started to pull back a little bit yesterday. It stalled out. Today it's it's down a little bit as well. But parabolic moves, it's just not a two-day pullback that sets them sets a reversal in play and says the move is over. So there's still a, a chance that it could go higher. Right now, when I look at the nat gas futures chart, you know, we took out the um, the high from that gas, took out the high from November 2018. The next major pivot high, you got to go back to 2014. And um, that's all the way around uh, 650. So, you know, there's still potentially another high that it could take because that's what markets do. Once they exceed one high level, the next level will be to stall and try to attack the next pivot high. So really, I mean, when you look at the NAC gas futures chart, I, I got to think 649, 650 is its next potential leg up. Now, sometimes it may not make that. Sometimes it may not get there. You got to remember this thing has really been, you know, especially since uh, August 19th, it's just taken off like a rocket ship. So whenever you go up straight up like that, you're going to need to do some backing and filling. And right now, I wouldn't say the NAC gas run is over because it's very hard to predict parabolic tops, but it is getting parabolic. All right. So want to go back six months to the last parabolic move that we followed in commodities, which was copper, right? Copper more than doubled from its low during the uh, March 2020 bust. And then it hit its all-time high of 480-something a pound. It's pulled back, but not in a meaningful way. It's still over $4 a pound. My feel here, and, and we talked about this extensively, Nick. Remember, I'm saying... Everyone's saying, well, Dr. Copper is saying the economy is going to be great. And I'm saying, no, Dr. Copper is saying that we're going to have tremendous inflation, all right? And we nailed it. Nobody else, none of these so-called experts with all these letters after their name that have uh, graduated from Havid and Yale and uh, all those wonderful schools out there that uh, get 100 grand a year, None of them could see this coming, Nick, but little old you and me working in our pajamas, from, not really our pajamas, but I'm in my sweats right now, from our home offices, we saw this coming a mile away. In, in, in fact, we talked about this in April and May of 2020, I believe. So, you know, we said inflation's coming, copper is on a breakout pattern. It's not because things are great. It's telling us that there's an inflation wave. And that's, you know, I mean, nobody could really have said it any better. And that was forecasted over a year ago, well over a year ago. Now you hear it every day on TV. Yeah, because okay, they caught up with us. The point is, this is life imitating uh, uh, daily market wisdom with Nick Santiago. You know, that's what this really is. I don't want to like... To put our pat ourselves on the back too much, but the point is that these guys uh, missed everything, and we nailed it. Yeah, and I made a lot of money in the copper place, you know, but I didn't catch the final, you know, last tick. I never do because I'm out before that. I don't need to sit in it for the highs, but I once it goes parabolic, I know that it's over and I'm going to sit aside. But one thing I'll tell you about the copper pattern, I love the pullback that it's making because it, it's not backing off. What it's doing is it's consolidating. And when you consolidate a gain like that, 
you're ultimately setting up to go higher. Now, how long does the consolidation last or how long does it need to keep forming that pattern? That's the big question. And that's what I work on at these at, at this time. It almost doesn't matter except to when you're ready to trade it, you want to know. But the point is right now, copper, $4. This is on the uh, spot for almost four twenty five a pound. All right. It's way above its uh, yearly average going back many years. It's not as high as it needs to go to really encourage new production for this green future that they all envision for us. Or it, it, we don't even need to say green future, just electrification requires a lot more copper. And, you know, the places where the copper comes from in the world, and this is just a macro view, places like Peru and Chile, they're all electing socialist uh, governments that are going to soak the uh, copper producers. Potentially, I, I don't think they're going to go as far as the fears are, but pri like every place else, the taxes are going up. Point is that that gas, I think, is going to do an identical pattern to copper. I think uh, it'll get to that six and change, pull back to the maybe uh, five and a half, and then we're going to see what happens here. I think it already has been, and there's nothing to say that Nat Gas can't do the same thing. I mean, Nat Gas has probably been the most underappreciated uh, commodity for the last past maybe 10, 10 15 years. So it, it's certainly uh, possible that Nat Gas can do it. But in the short run, when you when you make these parabolic moves, you're you're going to get pullbacks. Yeah, and uh, and Nat Gas, a lot of it has to do with electric. Uh, you know, nuclear power plants being shut down across the country by stupidity, like in New York, uh, just a real hot summer, which uh, leads to increased uh, electrical generation through nat gas power plants, all these factors. But And also, let's not forget about winter. If we have a colder than average winter, then nat gas will spike up. So there are demand reasons for it, but there's also the fundamental, the fundamental inflation play. But just think about what's going on in Europe. I mean, going on in Germany and, and Russia. I mean, you know, this is a global story, um, the Nat Gas story. It, it, it's bigger than most people think. Yeah, well, the U.S. became a net exporter of liquefied uh, natural gas, LNG. And we're like, because we're producing so much gas, we can't consume it here in this country. And uh, we were shipping it to Europe, but for some reasons, we're now shipping more of it to Latin America. And and then the only place where Europe can go to get gas is from uh, Putin. They're having production supply problems at Gazprom. All of this thing has converged. They have their nat gas prices are up six hundred percent. It's it's yeah. incredible. Yeah, and talk about parabolic spikes. So if they have a cold winter, hey, maybe they go up ten, fifteen fold. But that will send nat gas underappreciated its importance to the economy cheap nat gas in the u.s extremely important to the economy totally underappreciated uh, commodity and we're going to pay the price anyway we've run over it's a friday it's a big day though in the markets you need to watch out for these trends that we're talking about and you really need to go over to inthemoneystocks.com see how nick does it check out the twitter feeds at ITMS, at Nick Santiago 01, at Kerry Lutz. Emails are welcome at kl at kerrylutz.com. Nick, we'll talk to you Monday. Sounds good, Kerry. And so concludes another episode of Daily Market Wisdom with Master Trader Nick Santiago. Be sure to go to his website, inthemoneystocks.com. Don't forget the Twitter feeds, at ITMS and at Nick Santiago 01.